All right, welcome back. Shh. Welcome back, welcome back. I hope everyone had a, uh, a good weekend. Um, any questions before we get started? Okay, very good. Let's start off with a poll question to get yourselves back in the spirit of things, or something like that at least. Uh, here's your question. <clears throat> Adam owns Black Acre and White Acre. Adam sells Black Acre to Betsy, but reserves an easement that allows the owner of White Acre to cross across Black Acre. Betsy buys White Acre and then sells it to Carl. If you notice A, B, and C, it makes it easy for you, right? Carl can cross over Black Acre. True or false? True or false? Carl can cross over Black Acre. After you put answers in, true or false? <coughs> Another 10 seconds. <coughs> All right, five, four, three, two, one. Ah, last minute people got in. All right. Okay. Huh? Are you next? Thank you. I appreciate the candor. Well, let me let me ask you a question first. Uh, oh God, that's green highlight. Sorry, it's Brianna. Uh, Brianna. Oh boy, my my eyes aren't as good as they used to be. Um, there's this great story with George Washington, where he was in the middle of the Revolutionary War, and uh, some of his troops were unhappy. They weren't being fed. They weren't being paid. They were cold. They were tired. And there was some thought of having a mutiny. Imagine having a mutiny against George Washington. And there was one point where he comes into the room and he takes his glass off and says, I'm sorry, my eyes have grown tired by fighting for my country for so long. And like, he was like, oh my god. And then the mutiny died. Like, and so I can't pull that off. But anyway, my eyes are growing faint in the green highlight. So Brianna, uh, let's ask a question first, right? What kind of easement is at issue here? Okay, that's correct. Why is it an easement appurtenant? Um, because it follows the, um, the owner, <coughs> and so that would be like the easement that would be installed. Okay, very good. She's correct. This is an easement appurtenant, and the reason why is that the benefit goes not to a named individual, but in this case, the owner of Whiteacre. Okay, uh, and that's Gabriella. Let me ask you a question, please. What is in this question the dominant estate? And what is in this question the serving estate? Um, is dominant. Okay, why is Whiteacre dominant? It has the <coughs> Very good. Okay, which one's serving? Um, okay, why is Blackacre the serving? Because it converts into the owner of Okay, that's very good. Okay, so we have here an easement appurtenant, right? The one that's benefiting the dominant estate is, is uh, Whiteacre, as she said a minute ago. And the one that's being servient, that's the one that's serving, is, is Blackacre. Okay, so the question says, Adam owns Blackacre and Whiteacre. Adam sells Blackacre to Betsy, but reserves an easement that allows the owner to cross, cross Whiteacre. Now, if you recall, under the common law, you couldn't just give someone an easement, right? You had to attach the easement as part of a transaction. And that's what happened here. Adam sold Blackacre to Betsy, reserving an easement for himself to cross Blackacre. Everyone with me? Okay. So, Jalen, you're getting the next question. It says 
Betsy buys Whiteacre and then sells it to Carl. Can Carl cross Blackacre? True or false? Okay, you say false. Why is your answer false? Well, who who does the easement benefit? Whiteacre, right? And after Betsy sells Whiteacre to Carl, who's the owner of Whiteacre? Ah. So what's the answer here then? Hmm. What do you think, Rachel? Okay. Now, Rachel, let me ask you a question. For a brief moment, right, Betsy owns both Whiteacre and Blackacre. What happens to the easement during that time? Can you, can you have an easement against yourself? No. What happens to the easement? Oh, it does. It goes away. The answer here is false, my friends. Let's see. Oh, pretty close. And let me explain why. There's something called the merger doctrine. Right? Something called the merger doctrine. Right? You can't have an easement against yourself. It's not possible. At, at the point where Betsy owns both White Acre and Black Acre, the easement dissolves. It goes away because you cannot have an easement against yourself. Right? Therefore, by the time Carl comes to the picture, there's no more easement reserved for the owner of Whiteacre. It, it disappears. One second. Right? When you read these questions, you have to think in terms of the bundle of sticks. Right? Remember the bundle of sticks, our favorite, our favorite little metaphor. Right? Under the bundle of sticks approach, Blackacre was sold to Betsy. But it wasn't sold to her in fee simple. Black Acre was sold to Betsy with one stick missing in the bundle. And that stick was the easement. In other words, it gave the owner of White Acre the power to cross. So in other words, <coughs> there was one stick missing from the bundle, which was the right to cross. <coughs> okay. When Betsy went ahead and bought uh, White Acre, she now had both sticks. She had the partial bundle on White Acre, and she had the additional stick from Black Acre. They unite in the same person in what's called merger. And when you have merger, there's no more easement. One of the ways you can terminate an easement is by buying the other plot of land. If the same person owns both the servient and the dominant estate, that terminates the easement for good. In fact, terminating an easement is very difficult. Right? It's sometimes very difficult to terminate an easement. Merger is one of the ways you can terminate an easement. Saying, OK, I want to get rid of this easement. I'm going to buy the other plot of land. And so, and so if I bought another piece of land that someone else had the easement in, something previous, and I buy that out, that would be something that would be something that would be something that would be something that Uh -huh. I own White Acre. Yeah. And so to take out her easement on um, Black Acre, I could buy that and cancel out. Well, let me give you an easy way to explain it. If the same person owns both a dominant and a servient estate, that kills the easement. I think it's the easiest way of stating it. I think when you go back and forth, it's a little complicated. If the same person can have both a dominant and a servient estate, you kill the easement under what's merger. Yeah, Javier. Does that apply if the easement is sold to a third party? Well, that's an easement in gross, right? This rule is for an easement appurtenant, right? Which is why I said the asset thing was Brianna's or Gabriella's question. This is a rule for an easement appurtenant, right? When you have an easement appurtenant, you can have a dominant servient estate. Javier, I'll ask you the follow up. With an easement in gross, is there a dominant estate? There's not. So this rule would not apply. Yeah. And was it because that this is an appurtenant and not in gross that's different? Ex it, bingo, exactly. With an easement in gross, there is no dominant estate. 
Right? That was a question I think I gave you last week in the poll question. Right? This rule only works when the same person owns both the servient and the dominant estate. If the same person owns both black acre and white acre, the servient and dominant estate, any sort of easements are dissolved. They get rid of. And that's one of the few ways of getting rid of it. Terminating an easement is actually very difficult. That's one way to do it. Yes, Andrew, and then, and then Stephen. Uh, you said any sort of easement is terminated? But uh, it's just <laughs> uh, not an implied easement. And, and I was going to get to that in a minute. Okay. This is for an easement that's actually bought and sold for value, not one implied by the courts. Okay. Stephen? Um, I think the reason I got this confused was last week you talked about the easement by necessity. That's his question. Farming. That's his question. OK. That's why I made a fuss of saying this was an easement that was sold for value, right? With courts, courts can have what are called easements by necessity, for example, or an implied easement. The rules for an implied easement are a little bit different, right? An implied easement is basically an easement in gross, if you want to think of it that way, right? right? It's for this person at this time. Let's say the circumstances change, the court might dissolve it. But an easement by necessity is usually for the benefit of one person. So it doesn't, it's not treated the same way as in this case, it would be an easement appurtenant. This is why, my friends, at the very outset of these questions, you have to think carefully. Are you dealing with an easement in gross or an easement appurtenant? Depending on which one it is, the rules will be very different. Right? Characterizing it as the correct easement can basically change the fate of the question. Because with an easement in gross, this doesn't work. Because right? there's no dominant state. You can't have the merger. Which is why easement in grosses are much harder to terminate. Because basically you have to pay off the person. Right? You need what's called a release. Remember this from contracts, right? You have a release clause. You can have a release where you tell the person who has the easement and gross benefit, can you release me from this? Give me back my stick in the bundle. Pay me. Right? Pay me. That's, but it's voluntary. If he doesn't want to, it's not, you can't go around it. <coughs> I forgot the poll question. Now, I think the, the results were more or less 50-50, but for different reasons. Because some people maybe thought that uh, you know, maybe it was an easement and gross or whatever. But this is a good question to try and characterize how these easements operate. OK. Any questions so far? OK. Uh, the topic we have for today is how to transfer an easement. Um, it's more complicated than you think, right? Uh, and the reason why is you're not just selling your own land when you're transferring an easement. You're affecting a third party, right? Any time an easement is transferred, there's someone else who's, who's either being affected by it, either based on the dominant or the servient estate, right? Someone else is being affected. So the rules are a little bit different for transferring easements. And we use a word, we don't use the word transfer, that'd be too easy, right? Wouldn't that be simple? So we use the word assignment which means transfer, right? When you see the word assignment or assignability, it just means transfer. It just don't, don't get you know, tripped over the terminology. Just we can't use the word transfer. That'd be, too, that'd be too easy. OK. Now, um, uh, what am I up to? Tommy, let me ask you a question, right? Let's go back to our question over here, right? And you had an easement appurtenant. Let's pretend. Betsy never bought White Acre. And let's just say that Betsy kept the land, and then she died. And her heir inherits White Acre. Does the easement go on to the heir? In other words, if you, if you have an easement on your land, and you die, God forbid, and your heir inherits it, does the easement dissolve? Does it go away? No. no. Is your heir bound by that easement? Yes. OK, and the same question. If you're benefiting from an easement, that is, you're allowed to cross onto Blackacre, right? And you die. Can your heir now cross onto Blackacre? That's right. The reason why is easement appurtenants are passed automatically, right? An easement appurtenant, both the benefit and the burden pass automatically. Right, so whether you're the burden party or the benefited party, it transfers automatically to your heirs. Or if you sell Blackacre, the person you buy it from gets the benefit. The entire point of the easement appurtenant, the entire purpose of them, 
is that they're transferable automatically. That if you buy Blackacre, you get the benefit or you get the burdens. You don't have to take an additional step to transfer them, right? Why? Because it's tied to Blackacre. The entire purpose of the easement for tenant is either benefit or burdens tied to the land. So you don't have to worry about it. Okay. What about an easement in gross, right? So Melissa, let me ask you a question, please. With an easement in gross, is there a servient tenement? Uh, Think about it. I know. With an easement in gross, is there a servient tenement? Yes. Is there a dominant tenement? No. Okay, she's right. With an easement in gross, there is no dominant tenement, right? There is a servient tenement. So Melissa, do you think with an easement in gross, do the burdens transfer automatically? Why do you say no? Uh, because it's, it's it's I, I didn't say the benefit of the burdens. So let's say let's say we have an easement in gross, right? Mm -hmm. I own Blackacre, and I say I am giving Melissa an easement in gross that she can come into Blackacre. Mm -hmm. I die, and my heir inherits Blackacre. Is my heir required to let you on the land? Yes. Yes. The burdens transfer. Right, with an easement in gross, the burdens are going to transfer. But let's say that Melissa dies. Does her heir get to come to Blackacre? Shaking your head, no? no? That's correct. The answer is no. With the benefits in gross, the benefits are not automatically assigned. They, they might be. It's kind of complicated. We'll get to the specifics. But under the common law, at least, easements in gross, the benefit was not assigned. I want you to start thinking about these two phrases I keep using, the benefit and the burden, the benefit and the burden. We started a new topic on Thursday called covenants. Covenants are similar to easements, but they operate a little bit differently. There are different rules for when the benefits apply and when the burdens transfer, right? There are different rules. So why don't you start thinking, does the benefit transfer, does the burden transfer? So again, with an easement appurtenant, both the benefits and the burdens are assigned. With the easement appurtenant, both the benefits and the burdens are assigned. But with the benefits, I'm sorry, with the easement and gross, the benefits may not be assigned. It may, it, it depends, but it's not automatic. Yeah. So with uh, a power line easement, would the benefits just be necessarily spelled out in the company that buys out another power company? Is that kind of what they're paying for? Um, so I think the example you're giving is like if I allow a, a company to build a power line over my house, is that what you're asking about? I think the benefit will be assigned to the um, to the company. Yeah, but but under modern law, you can assign easements. That's not a problem. Under the common law, you couldn't. Everyone with me? Okay. All right. The first case is a little complicated, and if you had some trouble with the facts, it's okay. I every year I have trouble with the facts. When I read this case, like what's going on with Bernie and Fr Frank and Rufus, all the other people flying around. Um, and, and the first case is based on a very simple proposition that's unfamiliar to people in Texas. When water gets cold, it turns into ice. True enough, right? A lake in the winter, you can't swim on it, right? It's too cold. Maybe you go ice skating, right? Um, also, when water turns cold, becomes ice, you can use that for ice. Now, I had one says like, oh, that's gross. You're making ice where people swim. OK, you know, whatever. But, but th this, this was a case from, from Poconos, from uh, Pennsylvania, a very beautiful region. The water is very clean up there. Uh, and it involves a very complicated easement. So let's just, let's, it's going to take a few stabs. Let's just try walking through the facts this one, Natalia. Uh, you want to start with the facts, please, in the first case, Miller against uh, Lutheran Conference and Camp Association. Um, yeah, so it's about um, a lake. A lake, good.
Executor, yeah. Keep going, you're doing well, thank you. This is not, not an easy case, I, I freely admit that. Very good. I think very good, Natalia. This is not, not an easy case. Thank you so much for that. Um, this case involves the question of how easements can be transferred. Right? Um, if an easement was acquired jointly by two people, can they transfer it independently? Or must the easement be transferred in a single bundle? What is called a one stock in the case. All right. So let me let me walk through the timeline to make sure your notes are in the same, you know, in the same order. Um, in 1895, Frank and Rufus leased land for 99 years to the Pocono Spring Water Ice Company. Now, why this 99-year lease? I don't really know. They'll, they'll be dead in 99 years. I'm not sure why they even care. You know, why not just transfer it in fee simple? At some point, there's a reversion, right? It goes back to, uh, uh, I guess, Frank and Rufus. I'm sure 99 years from 1995, or I mean, I guess it was 1994, if my math is right. At some point, I guess, the lease ended. I'm not sure exactly what happened in 1994, but the lease would have ended then. Um, you see these leases for like 100 years, uh, you know, 500 year leases, are they even valid? Who knows? People wouldn't even remember after 100 years, but it was a 99 year lease. And then a couple years later, the company, Pocono Springs, puts a mortgage on the property. They want some money off of it. Um, then the company, Pocono Springs, gives Frank, I'm sorry, Frank, as a signs, the rights to fish and boat in the lake. The grant does not reference right to bathe, that is, swim in the lake. Okay, why is that important? Because there will be swimming in this water. Um, the next year, in 1900, Frank conveys to Rufus his assigns a one quarter interest in fishing and boating rights, and also assigns a one quarter interest in bathing rights. Now, John, let me ask you a question, please. At this point, does Frank have the ability to convey bathing rights? No, they argued that he did, but since um, the original deed or, uh, from the, the Pocono Spring Ice Company never mentioned the bathing rights specifically, Good. they said that, um, and it did mention the other rights. Good. Expressio unius, exclusio terius. Remember that one? Contracts? Right, what does that, what does that, that Latin phrase mean? No, you don't remember it? Very good, very good. Yeah, horror flashbacks went all right. Um, if you have a contract that lists fishing and boating but excludes swimming, then the implication is they deliberately excluded swimming. Now, you know, it's not insane. If you have a lake where people are driving boats and fishing, maybe you don't want people swimming in there. I don't know. Right, fishing hooks going in the water, boats driving around—that's kind of dangerous. So it's not like you know insane to think that the intent of the grantors was to only convey these two. But um, in California, where I grew up, there was a uh, lake that was specifically used for the water supply of the town. 
Yeah. And you could not swim, but you can go on a canoe, a kayak, whatever else. That's keep it clean? Yeah, to keep it clean. Um, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So a again, it's not insane that if this was also used for a water supply, they use it for ice, for example, as Pocono Spring Water and Ice Company, that they don't want people swimming around with their, with their, with their you know, bathing suits and stuff. Right? People make messes in water. So, okay, it's not insane. But that doesn't really matter, right? Uh, ben, because for the next 25 years or so, what did Frank and Rufus do in the water every year, or every summer at least? They did all three. They did all three. Now, were Frank and Rufus the only ones swimming in this water, Ben? No. Who was swimming in the water this, during this 25 years? Yeah, yeah, people from the people from the area came to go swimming. Now, Ben, what do you call it when something some activity goes on for, you know, a very long period of time and it's being used in a way that's contrary to the to the to the deed? What do you call that? Prescription, Prescription very good. Now again, this is not adverse possession and what, and, and the, I think the case uses a little bit fuzzy terminology, but I want you to use the right terminology. This is not adverse possession. The claim isn't that Frank and Rufus obtained the lake in fee simple. Instead, they obtained an easement by prescription, right? An easement by prescription, which doesn't give you the full bundle of sticks, does not give you fee simple on the lake. All it gives you, all it gives you is the ability to actually use the water in that fashion, which means you bathe in it. Okay? Now, Kyle. Who actually owns this easement that was obtained by prescription? Frank or Rufus, who owns it? I'm sorry? The company. Well, the company. No, 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 actually, we made a good point. Who owned the land at this point? And what rights did Frank and Rufus have by the deed? Well, no, by the deed. What did the deed give them the rights to do? Right. So who were Frank and Rufus basically squatting against, so to speak? No, but not themselves. The, yes. I'll make this point clear. The company is them, right? They are the company. But they're basically squatting against themselves, which is kind of weird, right? They were openly and notoriously possessing land against the company. Say, wait a minute, Josh. How can you squat against yourself? In the law, a corporation is a separate legal entity, right? Corporations are people, right? It's a separate legal entity. And even though Frank and Rufus were basically involved with this company, it was a separate entity in which they were squatting against. So they basically, yes, I guess in one sense, Kyle, you're right, they obtained an easement against themselves, but they, they didn't. They obtained the easement against the company. Make sense? Now, uh, is that Matt? Matt, let me ask you a follow-up then. Who owns the easement then? Frank or Rufus? How is the easement then owned? Uh, it's owned jointly. Jointly. What does that mean, jointly? I think you're right, but just tell me what that means. Together. Oh, good. That's, that's a good word. Undivided. That, remember that from joint tenancy from last, last semester? Think of it like a joint tenancy almost, right? It's, like a, it's an undivided interest in the land, right? They acquire this easement together. And, and the phrase is stock, S-T-O-C-K. They acquired it as a single stock, which, you know, you know think of like a, a share, like you have a stock, right? They, they acquired it together. Okay, but they wouldn't acquire it then until 1925 or, or, or at, uh, maybe 1910, but, you know, they acquired it at some point later. Anyway, okay, so let's go back to our timeline. In 1900, Frank and Rufus began to operate the bathing operation every summer. Oh, uh, Zach, does it matter that the uh, water was only being used in the summer and not year-round? How can they gain prescription if they're only using it for a couple months out of the year? A, a good review from the first week of the class. Do, how do you get prescription for, say, say the limit's 10 years. How do you get prescription if only there for three months out of the year? <coughs> No? This was very early on. Tyler? Because like that's that's only how people would ordinarily be using Bingo. Yeah, the standard for adverse possession with the continuous requirement is you have to use it in the same fashion that a reasonable person would use it. So let's say you have a ski resort, right? No one's there in the summer. If you use it for the winter months, it's enough. This is a summer resort. If no one's there in the winter, you're there. And there's a practical reason. In the winter, it's really cold in Pennsylvania. It's not like here where a cold front is 65 degrees, right? It's actually really cold. Is it, are you guys cold now? 
Oh, stop it. <laughs> no. It's actually cold there, and the water literally freezes over. If you're in there, you'll die of hypothermia, right? So you can't actually use it in the fashion as a bathing, uh, uh, as a swimming pool uh, in, the summer, in the winter. So that, that part was actually fairly, I think, I think one of the more fairly straightforward parts of the case. OK. So they acquired this prescription. But let's go back to uh, 1900, right? I'm sorry, 1902. Okay, uh, in, actually 1903. In 1903, the bank forecloses on the 99 year term. Wow, that was quick. This business did not do very well, did it, right? They basically take the mortgage on 1898 and barely five years later there's a foreclosure. Okay, and as you know from foreclosure, it extinguishes the rights. That's what a foreclosure does. And as a result of the foreclosure, it extinguished any rights for the Pocono Spring Water Company. And the sheriff put up on a sale, right? And it was sold to Pocono Pines Incorporated. OK. Who owned Pocono Pines, Alyssa? <laughs> it's kind of weird. <coughs> Basically, Frank's wife, right? So there was a foreclosure sale, right, 1903. And the insurance was sold to Pocono Pines Incorporated. But Pocono Pines was owned by Frank's wife. So basically, I just want you to understand the, the business situation. Frank defaulted on his mortgage, and his wife bought it at the foreclosure sale for, pe for pennies on the dollar. This is weird stuff going on, right? There's just, I, I, like, I never actually dug into the history too deep, but like, this is just, it's a weird case, right? In other words, for the entire what, 20 something years after the foreclosure, Frank kept operating the business which he had foreclosed, to, which he lost, and his wife was owning it. So there's probably something shady going on. I, don't, I can't tell you what, but that's shady. Anyway, so for some time, Rufus and Frank are operating this facility, and it's owned by the wife. So basically, I want you to think about this. During this entire time, Frank and Rufus are squatting on Frank's wife. Right, because she's the owner of the company. They are using, now is it actually hostile? Is it actually adverse? Probably not, but that doesn't really matter here. Okay. In 25, Rufus dies. Okay. Uh, is that, is that, that's Jen, right? Jen, what happens when Rufus dies? What, what happens to his interest in, the, in, the, in this easement? I think so. I think it probably would. I think that's probably right. Um, yeah, this case is always, it's, it's, a, it's a weird case. But the court holds that Rufus dies. So Rufus's heirs will have some interest. I think they would probably stand in the shoes of wherever Rufus was. I think that's probably the right answer. OK. In 1929, Rufus's executors right, give a license, a one-year license to bathe to the Lutheran Conference. Uh, Zeke, come back down to you, right? Rufus's executors gave a one-year license to the Lutheran Conference. Was Frank involved in that transaction? No, he was not. Was Frank still alive at this point? Um, I don't think so. I, I don't, did, did he die? I think he was. He wasn't running the business, at least. That's much for sure, right? So you can imagine Rufus's executor say, well, this lake is empty now, so we're going to transfer the one-year license to Lutheran Conference. Okay, what happens after they transfer the license, Zeke? Uh, well, the Lutheran Conference Association uses it. Mm -hmm. uh, they, I guess the campus is next to the lake. Yeah, it's operating. Then what happens next? Um, well, that's when the injunction is filed. So who, who, who sought the injunction, just so let's be precise here? Yeah, well, yeah, basically his wife, right? So, so the wife, Catherine, who owned basically the 99-year lease, right, which got the foreclosure sale, right, tries to stop the injunction, right, because she, she doesn't want this. So Frank's dead. Rufus is dead. The executors of the estate, of Rufus's estate, uh, uh, grant the license. So everyone get the facts. It's, it's a very complicated fact pattern. Ultimately, the question becomes, 
did uh, 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 this question is for Jacqueline? Did the executors of Rufus's estate have the ability to transfer a license to the Lutherans to 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 to, to swim? And so Jacqueline, has the, the court handled this one? It's a lot. I mean, just yeah. I don't. This case should be a lot simpler than it is, which always bothers me whenever I teach. It's actually not that hard of a case, but just the the, the decision is just it's, it's very long. Okay. Okay, Jack, let's try it like this. Um, when Frank acquired the title to boating and fishing, did the deed say anything about bathing? Okay. At what point was the right to bathing acquired? Roughly. It was at some point in the 19 teens, right? We don't know exactly when, but just say 1910, just make it easier, right? The court has this argument, which I don't fully understand, but it goes like this. When Frank made the quarter assignment for the bathing rights, he didn't have it yet. However, he later acquired it. The court applies a doctrine called equitable conversion. Equitable conversion, which means it relates back. In other words, even though Frank didn't have it in, in the, when he made the one quarter assignment, he got it later. And the court says, we will treat that one quarter assignment as valid. Okay. We'll treat the one quarter interest as valid. In other words, Frank had, a, uh, sorry, three quarters, and, and, and uh, what's his face? Uh, Rufus had a quarter, right? It was a valid transaction. Even though when it was made, right, you treat it not as indivisible, which I think someone said indivisible. I think that's a better answer. But here the court says you use this equal conversion doctrine to treat it as one quarter and three quarters. Everyone with me? So in other words, the easement that actually is at issue is not really the easement by prescription, right? It's the original grant from the one quarter conveyance. Again, what I'm saying it doesn't make any sense, I know. Let me say it one more time. They obtain the easement by prescription, good. But then you relate that back to the date of the original grant. And you pretend as if they had a regular easement all along. So the easement that winds up at the end after these two die isn't actually the easement by prescription. It's a regular e easement in gross. It's a regular commercial easement in gross. Let's say that one more time. I know, I know what I'm saying doesn't make a lot of sense, but it's, I'm trying to clarify this as much as I can. The reason why they gained the, 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 the right to bathe was because of prescription. But because in 1900, whatever year it was, they gave a quarter interest, you go back and you pretend at that time Frank actually had the full easement himself. So they have basically an easement and gross together. Everyone get that? It's, it's, it's a bizarre, weird thing. I don't like it, but that, that's how it works. <coughs> it was not obtained by prescription. It was actually basically, you pretend it was given originally in 1900. OK, so now you have this question, right? Uh, Ernest, we have an easement in gross, right? In general, is an easement in gross assignable? In general. In general. In general, you can convey an easement in gross. There are some rules attached to it, but in general, you can. It's not automatic, but you can do it. Now, but e Ernest, let me ask you a follow up. What happens when two or more people own the easement in gross? In this case, it was a quarter and three quarters, right? Can you assign, or can one party assign that sort of easement in gross? No, you have to have both parties 
Very good. Both parties have to consent. Think of like a joint tenancy, right? Actually, with a joint tenancy, one party can't convey. This is even worse. With, with an easement in gross, one party can't convey. It's what's called the one stock rule. You have to have unanimous consent. In other words, Frank can veto the action of Rufus's executor in selling it to the Lutherans. Right? The Lutherans can't get it from just one partner. The Lutherans would have to go to Catherine or Frank's estate as well. So this case is actually very simple. Like it stands for a very easy proposition. Easements and gross can't be assigned unless both parties agree. <gasps> That's a holding, right? It's such a simple holding, but it takes so many twists and turns to get there. Every year I say, don't assign this case, Josh, but then I, I sign it. It's, it. It bothers me, but it's, it, that's the case we got. Right? Yeah, Rufus cannot unilaterally allow the Lutherans to swim in the water. Therefore, the injunction was proper. And guess what? Courts have abandoned the one stock rule. <laughs> so under the, modern, uh, under the modern regime, this is all for naught, right? Under the modern regime, the one stock rule doesn't really have any effect anymore. Um, under the modern approach, you can actually divide an easement in gross in, in some cases. Yes, you. When I was reading the notes, I noticed that they said the utility companies and the railroads were the, the main reason that they uh, changed the law. Is that just because they were so common, or they didn't want to you know, hinder the Good question. I'm not sure. I, I, I suspect um, a lot of the railroads had easements across many plots of land, and you can imagine someone tries to sell their land, or you know, one railroad company buys another railroad company, you want to assign them. Right? At common law, if there was an easement in gross that was commercial in nature, you could assign it. But if it was not commercial, it was a residential, for example, uh, th then you couldn't. So these were largely <laughs> decisions that uh, helped companies have uh, easements over wide pat, uh, spots of land. If you look at the first note and the second, I think they talk about some of this history. Hmm. Good questions. All right, everyone get the holding. It, it, it's, a, it's a weird case, and I always say, Josh, don't assign it, but I think it's useful to learn. And I think in this case, the court used were prescription to refer to both adverse possession and the easement. They sort of use fuzzy language, so just don't do that. Um, any question on the first case? No? All right, let's go into the second case, please. Um, Brown versus Voss from Washington. And we have another case from the Hood Canal uh, in Washington. You remember our first week of the semester, we had Howard versus Kunto, which was in the Hood Canal. And if you remember, this was this very jagged piece of land that was near, uh, uh, that was near Seattle, Washington. Okay. Uh, hey, Stephen, I think you're next. All right, you want to please give me the facts in uh, Brown? Um, yeah, so this has to do with the, the dominant and subservient states. So servient, not subservient. Oh, servient. Yeah, just people all the time. It's not subservient, it's just servient. Just, just get your terminology. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I was a little confused by this one, but it says uh, the predecessor, Parcel A, granted to the predecessor owners of Parcel B, a private road easement. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, it says that they acquired parcel A in 73, so they owned it for about 20 years. And uh, they bought parcel B and parcel C as well, um, but from Good. two different owners. And um, they bought it from a, s a single family. I'm not. All right, let me, let me walk through it, and then that, that makes a little more sense, right? Just this map is in your book, uh, may, may help it make a little bit more sense. So you have parcel A, you have parcel B, and you have parcel C, okay? You have the road over here, and you can see there are lots of trees here. The only way to get onto the road is by crossing over parcel A. Do we get at least that much? Oh, okay. 
OK. So let me just walk through the timeline. Um, in 1952, the predecessor of A gives the predecessor of B a private road easement. Right? In other words, you can drive from B to A to get to the road, or you can drive across A to B to get to the house. Right? Um, that, was, that was the arrangement. Ingress means entry. Egress means exit. At some point, D acquires lot A. Okay. And then the plaintiff buys lot B. There's a house on B. And the house that they build straddles a line. It's mostly on B, but it spills over the border onto par, pa, pa, uh, lot C. Okay, and At some point, the plaintiff buys lot C. Now, I don't know how, how the owner of lot C existed. Right? Just think, think about it for a minute. Whoever owned lot C could not get to the road without trespassing. And maybe he just did it without asking. Maybe no one cared. But whoever was lot C had no easement of any sort on the land. OK. So we have a case, right? Uh, Bobby, we have lots B and C are landlocked. right? There was an easement that the owner of B could cross over to A, but the facts changed. OK, now walk me through the case. Yeah, well, well, start when things are going wrong, because that's usually when the courts get involved, when things start going viol very wrong. So um, so when the plaintiffs started to work on the residence in the house in parcel B and part of part C, um, the defendants started to, I guess, bar their, obstruct their way into. They didn't just obstruct. What they actually do? They threw a log. They basically built a wall, right? Yeah. Yeah, this is what we call a spite fence. Courts hate when you do this, right? If you build a spite fence, you're probably going to lose. Like, I don't care what your case is. If you actually do this, you're probably going to lose. All right, come on, Bobby. Uh, so after they did that, um, plaintiffs sued to remove the obstruction, uh, try to get an injunction to allow them to continue using the easement. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, but these are wealthy people. These are not like poor people. This is a very wealthy area of the state. So these are people who have a lot of money, and they want to build these like houses right by the water, and they want to get to the road. Now, uh, uh, Danny, what would be a smarter way for the state to resolve this issue? If, you, if you're the state, how do you make this issue go away? Just, just, look at, just look at the picture for a minute. What would be a, a better way of doing this rather than having one of these easements? Well, I know in the case they talked about condemnation. Yeah, what does that mean? What does condemnation mean? You're right. What's, what's that phrase mean? Uh, it would be uh, to condemn a private way of necessity over the existing. What, what does condemn mean? You keep using that word. What does condemn mean? Um, to uh, basically state that that area of land uh, can, I don't know, can no longer be used for the original. You want to, when you use the word condemn, you think of like, a, like an old property that's like abandoned in bad condition, right? That's what you think of. When you hear the word condemned in this class, think of eminent domain, right? Think of the power of the state to seize private property. Danny, what land would the, would the state be seizing here to make this case go away? Just look at this picture. What, what would the owner of B really want? Does B want to cross over A's land? What does B want to do? Yeah, and how would you connect directly to the road? What would you have to do? Create another Yeah. <laughs> Take a little bit of land here so you can cross the road. Right? Or make a public road. Instead of having to trespass, put a little road over here that the street goes there. That way anyone can access it. Right? Generally, when the state is involved, right, and the state has a landlocked piece of property, they can use eminent domain to seize the land and build a road across. 
Now, this would, of course, diminish A's value, for sure, if there's a road going in his land, but the state can do it, and the state doesn't have to negotiate. They can give you a price, and say, that's your price you're going to get, and it's too damn bad. Uh, we'll talk about eminent domain later this semester, but I think everyone agrees that building a road is a valid public use. I think everyone at least goes that far, right? So they could just build a, a road, but that takes time, right? That takes environmental impact statements, you're building by the water, all these you know, sugar you have to satisfy. There's a lot of stuff you have to do, right? Kaylee, before eminent domain can go forward, they decide to take this in their own hands, and the court has to adjudicate it. So let's just start off on uh, just the basics. This, I think, is the easier part of the case. Does an easement across A for the benefit of B work for this new house that's being constructed? Does the easement allow this new house that's being constructed to benefit from it? Good. Well, what do you mean add on? I mean, what difference does it make? People live on B. Who cares if the house is also on C? Well, why is that a, who cares? Well, I mean, that like the original agreement had the easement. It was only for parcel B. Right. Uh, so the generally you can't just add on an adjacent. Why not? Well, you, that's, that's correct. But why can't you extend an easement? Um, or why can't you um, uh, expand an easement? Bingo, right? Here it's like, oh, Josh, what's the big deal? It's just a few other, you know, uh, houses a little bit bigger. You're expanding the burden. If the court expands the burden to the owners of B and C, what if like an apartment complex is built there, right? What if you build an entire new house with like an eight-car garage, something insane, right? Jay Leno brings up his you know, garage there, right? What if you do that? At that point, you've already extended the easement. Uh, maybe you can go back to court and modify it. Maybe you don't. So whenever a court is asked to expand an easement, they usually treat it strictly, uh, very strictly, right? Um, now, you have the necessity doctrine, though. If, in fact, C is landlocked, wouldn't the court just imply a necessity easement? Okay, But that's a different question, right? I want you to separate these two in your head. An easement by necessity is different than expanding an existing easement, right? To show an easement by necessity is it strictly necessary. Well, you can just build a house there and not go a little bit further. Maybe, maybe it's not strictly necessary. So there are different kinds of easements that, are, that, that, that the courts can create. <coughs> you have an easement by necessity, and also you can extend an easement as well. Okay, so that's the first part of the opinion, which I think is probably right, where the court recognizes that um, you're not going to expand the scope of an easement. Okay? So far, so good, right? But then things take a, a weird turn, and Every time I'm like, what just happened? Like, I, I get like whiplash. Like, what, what just happened, right? I think the dissent is like, what's going on? Ashrissa, what, what happened? The majority did a weird thing, and, and it confuses students every single semester. What, what, what happened at the end? Did they dissolve? Did, did, what, what happened? There should not be an injunction. Okay. <coughs> what does that mean, though? Um. Right. They reversed the 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 appellate court. Right. That much we know. But they reinstated the judgment in favor of the owner of the serving estate, Lot A. What what happened there? Okay, good. What does that mean, abuse of discretion, Sharissa? I think that the court was overstepping. Um, yeah, Angela, let me call on you for a minute. I, uh, Shannon, she lost her voice, so I, I will graciously pass over her. She's like, thank you. Uh, Angela, let me call on you for a minute. The court finds that you can't extend the easement. But then what do they do? Well, what they do is they say, oh, this is a court of equity. There's not going to be a huge additional burden on plot A because it's still a single family residence, regardless of where it's located. And so it's not going to put an actual 
additional burden on the easement. Okay. So let's say just oh equity, leave it alone. Okay. I I, I think he's I think he just said it well, right? The court finds that the easement should not be extended. That's the precedent, right? So if you were now a lower court in the state of Washington, that's your, that's your new rule. You do not extend easements. But as a matter of equity, the court finds that it would be inequitable to deny the owner of B the ability to cross over to A. Andrew, how do you, what, 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 what do you make of this? I, I, just, I, I think you're right. I think you say the case correctly, but how do you, what do you make of this? Okay. And they probably should have kept the injunction. But the injunction that, that would block uh, B from going out to A, right? Well, from C. I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah. So, you, in other words, you should have kept, I want to make sure we get the parties right, right? The injunction was that the owner of B slash C can't go into A, right? Right. Okay. That, that was what the injunction they wanted. And the court says, well, we can't really extend the easement, but we'll still allow them to go onto the land. In other words, no injunction. So I want to get the just sort of flipping you out. So Jessica, let me ask you a question, please. What's the dissent's argument? Justice Dorr or Dorre, I don't know how you say it. Uh, so he basically said that they were wrong because they had the knowledge that it was Yeah. Yeah, in other words, if in fact the easement doesn't extend to lot uh, C, why are we allowing the owner of lot C to cross over? So I, let me try to maybe give you my explanation of what's going on here. I, I can't, I don't know for sure. But the way I read this, um, the court didn't want to set a bad precedent, right? They set the right precedent. But in this case, the equity moved them. And why did the equity move them? I think the stumps and the logs and the stuff Right? Whenever you put up these sort of spite fences, you're going to lose in court. I can't tell you why, but every case I've seen where they have these sort of spite fences, the guy loses. So um, if you don't want someone, is this that negative? If you want to stop someone, go to court, don't take self-help, right? Remember self-help from torts? Generally in property, when a property owner engages in self-help, they lose. Even if they're right on the law, in this case illustrates it with clarity. Remember the cases with the landlord where the, they, uh, one person changed the lock on their tenant? Remember they were hanging over the, the roof trying to look in? Right? When you change the locks, you're going to lose. Right? The courts just don't like it. I can't tell you why. I don't mind self-help. I think it's useful. But you know, what do I know? Uh, but like, you know, if you ever have a tenant and you're trying to get rid of them, don't change the locks on them. Go to court. Because if you change the locks on them, you're probably going to lose. Right? If someone's trespassing on your land, don't put a bunch of tree stumps in the middle of the road. Right? Uh, we had the case in West Virginia, put you know, the, the steel cable across the road um, from about a week ago. Don't do that. If you do that, you get in trouble. All right, so the bottom line is, in the state of Washington, the easement for the benefit of A does not extend to the benefit of C. Black letter law. But in this case, they'll still allow B to cross onto A. Go figure. All right, that, that, that's the whole thing. Yeah, Kaylee. Yeah. So how that evidence was brought in by That's a good question. The, you know, the scumbaggiest person I ever met, the wife is a bozo. You see these these comments in the notes, right? You know, I don't I don't know. Uh, very often appellate courts are limited to the record before them. And if evidence wasn't put in the record before them, they can't really consider it. Yeah. So if it had no uh, well, yeah, if in fact there was access to C, then they would have needed it. But maybe like it wasn't the best road. Maybe it's like driver over like, like, like brush or something. Maybe it was accessed by foot, not by vehicle. You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not really sure. I don't think the book says precisely. But good question. Uh, Stephen? Did he say that the easement by necessity were only in the case of um, as long as it's like the most reasonable or the least? Strict, necessity? strict necessity. Strict. Well, I don't know if Washington was a strict necessity. Say. I'm not sure. Because it seems to me that the closer access would just be from the front of the property where the road is. Yes. And if, if that, if a twenty-foot wide easement across that property would be well, but they didn't go to court to ask for an easement by necessity. You have to ask for a remedy. They argue we don't need an easement by necessity. We want to use our existing easement to extend it. 
So the court is limited based on the request that's sought, based on the remedy that's requested. Well, I just think when I look at it, I see an easement across A and B, mm-hmm. and then whoever owns the other part of the road as well, you're, you're intruding on three or four or five yeah. other people's property rights as yeah. opposed to one. Yeah, wouldn't that be easier? Yeah. It seems like it would be the more direct route. Right. I mean, the easiest road is a condemnation of the eminent domain, which just gets them right to the main road, because that obviates the need for all these easements to think about. But that wasn't an issue here. Eminent domain is brought by the state to take years to litigate and actually build the damn road. The scumbaggiest person I've ever met, right? You know, the, 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 again, these people hated each other, right? They, they have the really bitter neighborly disputes. Yeah, Andrew? It seemed like the, they were trying to kind of blur the merger doctrine in that they bought this extra piece of land and because the easement... Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, it, it sounded like they were, the, yeah. they were trying to blur it to make it... It's almost reverse merger. merger. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. When you buy Black Acre and White Acre, your easement for Black Acre sends to White Acre. Right. And yeah, I see what you're saying. Works. No, that's not how it works it's, at all. It sounds like when they were struggling with it, it sounded like that's what they were thinking would happen. Yeah, I think I think that's I think that's fair. Yeah. Good question. Yeah, uh, Jessica. Yeah. Not have a right. Well, I mean, generally, if you're if you're honest, it's better. But if you try and cover stuff up, courts don't <coughs> like it. I mean, ultimately, the way this should have been resolved is that um, B should have offered A some money for an easement, and that would have probably resolved it. But instead, he probably just said, "Oh, let me just drive across this and piss them off." Right? These things can be resolved out of court for a much lower price. Once they get to think about this, this is appealed to the highest court in the state, the state supreme court. That's not cheap. And then was it that each party pays their own fees or something, basically? So, so basically, they, they all have to pay their own legal bills. The lawyers always get paid, that's for sure. But the, 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 the clients, I think, would not serve well here. All right, questions on the second case. Um, I want to say a brief word on how to terminate an easement, how to end an easement, which is um, uh, more complicated than you think. Uh, so one way to end an easement is what's called release, where I am the dominant a state where I have the uh, easement and gross either way, I release it. I am relinquishing my right. And the effect of that is to basically give the person uh, their own bundle back, right? You know, they had, uh, they're missing a stick and then they get their full bundle back that fee simple. So release is one way of <laughs> restoring fee simple and eliminating an easement. Um, you also have an easement that has a term limit. You know, I can cross this land for five years and then it expires on its own terms. You can do that. Um, if it's an easement by necessity, the easement ends when the necessity ends. Right? It's not a permanent easement. Um, another way an easement can terminate is merger. That was the poll question we had earlier today. If one person comes to ownership of both the dominant and the servient tenement, the dominant and the servient estate, the easement dissolves. It just it disappears. Um, another way to terminate easement is what's called a estoppel. Um, and this is our, our favorite fairness argument, where if the servient owner uh, reasonably relies on a statement made by the easement owner, it's gone. So again, generally to release an easement, you have to have in writing of the statute of frauds, right? Easements have to be in writing. But what if you know, the owner of the dominant state says, you know what, Joe? Don't worry about it. I'm going to get rid of this easement. There's nothing in writing but just an oral statement, right? If it's an oral statement. And then he relies on it and starts building on top of this land. He says, no, I, I have a written easement. Estoppel says, even though you don't have a writing, you only have an oral statement, notwithstanding the statute of frauds, the courts will say the easement terminated, terminates. Question so far? Um, another way is what's called condemnation, which is eminent domain. If the government condemns this piece of land and builds a public road, which they can do, at that point, if they build a public road, the easement goes away, right? When the government seizes land, the easements aren't dissolved. And the reason why is when the government seizes the land, it's for the public anyway, right? Anyone can use that road. You don't need an easement anymore. By virtue of seizing the land for the public use, the public can use it. Duh, right? Makes sense. 
All right. Uh, another one is prescription. This is when you actually uh, uh, openly and notoriously and adversely occupy or actually cross over a piece of land for 10 years, whatever it is. Right? If you are basically taking land, I'm sorry, you are, you're using land for the same period of time, you can actually dissolve the easement that way. Right? So in other words, you take someone else's easement. Let's just say in this case that B had the right to cross over A. If B never uses the easement, and someone comes along and walks that land for a decade, that person takes B's easement from him. Right? It's a weird thing. You can actually prescribe. You can actually take by prescription someone else's easement. <coughs> the same way you can use adverse possession to acquire a piece of land, you can adversely possess an easement. Weird, right? You, you, you can adversely possess someone else's easement. If you, they don't use their easement, and you're using it, and they're aware of it, and they don't stop you, you take their easement away from you. Kind of weird, right? Yeah? Does that only apply to an exclusive easement? That would have to be an easement in gross, I think. Right, if someone has an easement in gross, and they never use it, and you use their easement for them, you can basically gain that easement by prescription which is kind of weird. I'm just, I can't imagine it's very common, but it happens. Um, the last, uh, another way to uh, uh, terminate an easement is what's called abandonment. Um, if you don't use an easement for some period of time, uh, it dissolves. Um, how long this has to be is a very controversial issue. And I'll give you an example. Um, there were lots of easements for train tracks across the country throughout the 18th century. I'm sorry, the 19th century. Lots of train tracks. Uh, a lot of those train tracks have been abandoned. They just don't run trains in them anymore. In some cases, they actually pulled up the rails. In another case, they just left the rails in place. Right? What happened to all those easements owned by the railroads that were abandoned? Um, if an easement's abandoned, does it revert? Um, does it does a fee simple re revert back to the property owner? Who gets it? There were a lot of cases where the government started building parks, public trails, on these railroads. They were called the rails to trails. Sounds like a lovely thing. Uh, and the courts had to discuss who actually owns this land. Were, was, were the easements actually abandoned? Or is using the railroad for walking consistent with the original easement? Right? I gave you an easement for transportation on a railroad. Does that include transportation by walking or bicycle? There are lots of cases, and won't, I won't bore you with them. But there's a lot of litigation on abandonment. Um, one of the last ways an easement can be abandoned is when the terms change. So let's say, um, let's say for example, I'll use the example I just gave. Uh, there's an easement for uh, railroads, right? And we don't use trains as much anymore. So now we're using it for bicycles. People are using it for a bike path. Um, <coughs> if you change the terms of the easement, does the easement dissolve, right? Let me give you an example. This is a favorite one. Uh, have you ever heard the example or the, the uh, sort of legal <laughs> doctrine about no vehicles in the park? You guys ever heard this one? Uh, no vehicles in the park. This was actually in the news recently. Uh, Mackinac Island in Michigan, it's a small resort town where only uh, vehicles are not allowed, no cars. And since the 1890s, they've had a law saying no uh, the statute says no horseless carriages, right? That's what they call them, right? No horseless carriages, whatever the hell that is, right? No horseless carriages. And then the vice president uh, went there and he had his you know, SUVs, right? <coughs> not, not what I'm asking about. You have a sign that says no vehicles in the park. <coughs> um, what's a vehicle? This is a, a classic law school puzzle, right? Uh, I took this picture at Fort uh, Mason Park. It's right by the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. Uh, and I was like, oh my god, no vehicles in the park. I saw the sign. I was so excited. Now, this picture is a little bit blurry, Josh. Why is it blurry? This guy was coming down the bike really fast. Up there, you see him? So I almost got knocked over. He came down real fast because they're very steep hills in San Francisco. But, you know, you see a sign that says no vehicles in the park. Ah, uh, Maria, I'll ask you the question, please. Right? This, you have an easement that says no vehicles in the park. That's what the easement says. No vehicles in the park. Okay, what's a vehicle? Device. How do you def okay, give me give me an example of what a vehicle is. Uh, an example? Yeah. A car, a bicycle. Okay, and so 
Why, why are all those things vehicles? Because they transport you from around. OK. What about a horse? I mean, this was an old sign. Been around since the 1800s. There were no cars back then. Is a horse a vehicle? So then how would you define a vehicle? <coughs> Man-made, OK. Andrew, what's a vehicle? It would have to be a device. I'm sorry? I'd say it would have to be a device. What do you mean a device? It's something, like, like I said, uh, man-made. Does it have to have wheels? So are you getting at shoes as being potentially a... Is, it, is a shoe a device for getting around? I don't know. You tell me. Technically, I guess. Laura, what's a vehicle? I mean, I, it, okay, I could have wheels then. Wheels, okay. Wheels, yeah. So wheels that so carry something around? Yeah. Okay. What about a baby carriage? Is a baby carriage a vehicle? Yeah. So no, vi no, no baby carriages in the park? Well, you got to take it somewhere else then. <laughs> <laughs> what? No vehicle. Kyle, what's a vehicle? Um, yeah, not necessarily anything, but uh, you know, maybe something like motor, motorized. Uh, so, bicycles, yes. Cars, no. <coughs> yeah. Okay, what about a horse? Horse has no motors. Um, probably not. I, I guess it'd be like an intent thing, like what we're Oh, intent. So, we'll, uh, give me a little bit more. The intent of whom? Whose intent are we thinking? So we ask, what were they thinking about when this sign was put up? Is that what you're saying? Let me tell you, Andrew, let me give you this hypo, right? This sign was put up in the 1880s. There were no such thing as cars. They didn't even know what a car was. They, they knew what trains were. They knew what a car was. Would cars be allowed here? They didn't even know what that was. They couldn't even think about something like that. If it was going purely by legislative intent, yeah. yes. But yeah. Well, how, how would they have defined a vehicle back in the 1880s? Carriage, maybe a horse, and bicycles. Those, you know, the big, the big front wheels, right? Tony, how should we how should we interpret the phrase vehicles? Maybe how vehicles are interpreted today is that a good way of the signs? A hundred years old. Should we be looking to modern dictionaries? Yeah. Uh, the terms can change depending on the time. The terms change, but does the statute change? Does the sign change? It's been there for a hundred years. Uh, it's it's so huh? Yeah, wheelchair is a good example too. You know, wheelchairs in the park. No crutches in the park. <coughs> yeah, Ethan, patiently waiting. Um, does this not say that anything that can fit through those posts is fair game? Oh my goodness, I think a horse could probably fit over them. Uh, it's actually fairly wide. I think you could probably fit a bicycle through there. Maybe a motorcycle. Now, the reason why I'm giving you this, there's not a right answer. But this is something that law students often do because it, it, it teaches a few lessons, right? How do you understand the meaning of a text, right? You don't take classes in statutory interpretation. Maybe in common, you do this a little bit. But there are different ways of figuring out text, right? The phrase vehicle seems pretty straightforward, but depending what time frame, it can be different things. There were no cars in the 1880s, right? And they probably couldn't have anticipated what a car was. But can you give an easement that says no vehicles an understanding based on <coughs> their expectations or on how the word has evolved today? Um, and the short answer is with easements, the court are very uh, living constitutionalists, so to speak. Right? The courts are very open to uh, adapting the phrase to change circumstances. So if you have an easement for a railroad, the court said, well, a railroad is close enough to a, a bicycle, so therefore it's covered. It's like transportation. I'm not a fan of those decisions, uh, but, but, those, but those cases do exist. So you do have situations where the, the terms are fixed, but the courts give evolving meaning to those terms. And that's how some of the courts evolve, uh, address these issues. So they can basically update an easement for the modern year. Again, Josh is not a fan of those cases, but no one asks my opinion. It doesn't really matter. OK. Questions? OK. Thursday, we are starting the topic of um, covenants. Um, it's going to be a hard topic. Uh, the readings are not very long, uh, but I encourage you to read it very carefully. And in your notes, I want you to make sure you understand the difference between equitable servitudes and real covenants at law. 
uh, the difference between equitable servitudes <coughs> and real covenants at law. Okay, what's the difference? Um, equitable servitudes are not in writing. They are servitudes that are created by the courts. So the first case, Tolk versus Moxie, involves a servitude created in equity by the court. Okay. The last case involves a covenant. A covenant is a type of servitude that's put in writing. And it has to be put in writing and has to meet certain re requirements. So the last case, Sanborn, uh, involves a written covenant. Okay. Um, you're going to start confusing these top terms. I know you will. You're going to confuse equitable <coughs> servitudes. You're going to confuse covenants. You will confuse easements with covenants. Um, you cannot confuse them. You have to keep these terms distinct in your minds because if you confuse them, you are going down a deep hole, which it's hard to climb out of. So get your terminology straight. Anything else? All right, for those of you celebrating Yom Kippur, have a good fast, and I will see you all on Thursday. Thank you. Yeah.